everyone, thank you for joining us for this presentation on Oregon's Black history with Kim Moreland of Oregon Black Pioneers. I'm Laurel Westendorf, part of the Community Relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme, and this month's theme is place. Our presenter today is Kim Moreland, Vice President of the Oregon Black Pioneers, which is Oregon's only historical society dedicated to preserving and presenting the experience of Black Oregonians statewide. Kim has over 25 years of public sector community development, economic development, and urban planning experience. She has dedicated much of her time to volunteer service with community-based cultural and heritage nonprofit organizations. She was also recently highlighted in the Restore Oregon Field Notes magazine as a preservationist. Kim Moreland, thank you so much for sharing your well-researched history of Black Oregonians with us. Yeah, thank you, Laura. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. I Today, I will provide uh, information about our organization, provide a little overview of Oregon Black settlers, and we'll take a closer look at Black places associated with Black history. And I'll share my screen. Today, uh, the title of today's presentation is Black Places of Black History in Oregon. As Laura mentioned, um, the Oregon Black Pioneers are just to preserve, educate, and share the rich history of African Americans in Oregon. The, we, uh, we were established in um, 1993 and officially recognized as a 501c3 in 1994. We are at one time in our volunteer organization and we just hired our first executive director, Zachary Stocks. Um, and we're so excited about um, our new uh, executive director and the growth of our organization. We fulfill our mission through um, exhibits, um, presentations like this one. We also do, uh, um, we have two publications, one per crop perseverance, it's the history of Million and Polk County, and also, I, a publication that I authored called The History of African Americans in Portland. And it's uh, part of the image, it's part of uh, Arcadia Publishing Images of America series. Marcus Lopez was one of the first person of African descent in Oregon. Many of the people don't know that Black history um, it goes back almost 400 years in Oregon, what would become Oregon. In 1578, Maria Diego, Diego and two African Panamanians um, reached a good and fair bay, which was really uh, likely to be the Wells Cove of Oregon. Um, and they arrived aboard the Sir Francis Drake ship, the Golden Pine. In 1788, Marcus Lopez of Cape Verde Islands arrived in Tillamook. Tilly Bay in 1788 aboard Captain Robert Gray's ship called the Lady Washington. And this um, history has been memorialized on a historic marker um, on uh, Highway 101 in Tillamook. And um, it had an unfortunate ending when there was a dispute over a cutlet that led to his premature death. And um, he is one of the one of the first documented persons of African descent in present day Oregon. York is another one that arrived in 1805 with the Lewis and Clark Discovery Corp. And there are several um, um, ways that he has been memorialized in Oregon. There's um, and there's a street in Portland named York. Um, there's also an exhibit at in Astoria National Park that talked about the history of York, as well as a statue at Lewis and Clark that was created by Allison Starr. And Lewis um, and York was a very intimate part of the discovery court. And um, unfortunately, when he arrived home after the, uh, the journey and discovery of this area or rediscovered this area, <laughs> um, he, he was not granted the privilege that the other was granted, and he remained enslaved by um, Lewis um, until um, much later.
on the arrival of, um, of the early settlers um, to Oregon, you would see several uh, Oregon exclusion laws that prevented um, the growth of an African-American settlement in the, what would become Oregon. In June 1844, the provincial government um, declared that slavery is illegal, but Black people could not live in Oregon. In 1718, September 1849, the ter territorial government um, passed another exclusion law forbidding Blacks and mulattoes from settling in the newly declared territory. In 1857, voters approved a Black inclusion clause as part of the proposed Oregon Constitution. In February 14, 1859, um, the state of Oregon is admitted to the union with a constitution that included exclusion laws and remained on the books until 1926. In 1843, nearly 1,000 men, women, and children made a five-month journey with 120 wagons and 5,000 cattle. Over the next 25 years, more than half a million people went west on the Oregon Trail. Today, uh, travelers can follow their trails around, along Route 66 or Route 2 and 30. And um, the Homestead Act was also approved in 1850 and declared that only white settlers and the children of white males settlers in Oregon and their Native American wives were eligible to receive free um, land from the government. From 1850 to 1854, white settlers could claim 300 acres of land for free, 340 acres of land for free. Traffic, traffic declined significantly from 1855 to 1862 because Oregon pioneers were required to pay for the government land. The denial of this uh, economic, uh, opportunity for economic prosperity for non-white immigrants had great impact on the Oregon African-American population. The Oregon African-American population remained very small and for future generations. Oregon um, most importantly, it would, um, it would concentrate um, uh, African-American population in urban areas rather than the countryside. And as you can see here, there was only 55 uh, Oregon Black pioneers that was counted um, in, uh, in comparison to 12,093 uh, white settlers. This is the, the trail that, um, the Western Trail that most immigrants followed during those times the Oregon Trail, the Applegate Trail, and the California Cutoff Trail. And here is a home of two early Black settlers who came across um, one of those Western trails. Um, right here to your upper right, to my upper right, is Hannah and Elijah Gorman House that is uh, still standing in um, Corvallis, Oregon on Highway 99, and it's recently nominated at the Historic Landmark Commission, uh, Landmark. Um, to your right, bottom right is the Cora Cock House, and this is, uh, uh, um, this was um, the home of Cora and Cox, who was a slave of, of one of the owners of the Johnson Land land uh, donation land claim. And in 1864, she, the, the owner's wife, um, gave Cora Ann Cox several acres of land. And this is the home that she built in Brownsville, Oregon. And to your left, from my left, there's a, this is a picture of myself in the center and two volunteers who worked on a bus tour um, and when we stopped in Brownsville at the Cora Ann Cox home. And the lady to the right is one of the um, staff members of the Brownsville Historical Society. <laughs> Another early um, Black pioneer was David and Leticia Carson. David and Leticia Carson came across the Oregon Trail in um, 
in the early 1840, in the early, in 1844, I believe. And um, they settled in what was called Soap Creek, which is just uh, it's south of Salem and um, north of uh, Corvallis. And David and Leticia uh, owned several cattle. They owned, they had a donation land, um, land claim, we get, claim we given to David. And when David died, they took um, her, her land because they thought that as a, um, as they did not recognize their marriage and as a slave, she wasn't entitled, but she fought that. And she moved to uh, Davis Douglas, um, Douglas County. And she eventually in 1865 received a, a donation land claim of her own and was compensated for the land that she lost in Soap Creek Valley. The picture to your left is Gwen Carr and Arthur Jane Kirkpatrick at the uh, at the gravesite of Leticia Carson in Douglas County. And Jane Kirkpatrick had a wonderful book where she fictionalized the life of Leticia Carson. And next is George Washington. Um, he stopped, he traveled along the Oregon Trail as well. And he was in search of a decent place to live. And uh, he stopped in Milwaukee and had a, um, and he lived there for um, a short period and, and he uh, eventually left and moved to what would become Washington State because of the restrictions of African American to um, own land and own and live in, in Oregon. And so he was one of those who um, eventually landed in the Oregon Territory but left. And he, he is now, he became the founder of Centralia, Washington. And this is the map of George Washington journey um, from Missouri to um, Oregon City. And, um, and in his journal, he said there was 117 days of hard travel that brought us to Oregon. Despite some of the challenging times and the backdrop of exclusion laws, Black people did settle in Oregon and Oregon Black pioneers have created a map that shows um, uh, pictures of Black pioneers and who have settled in our various counties. And one of those is Richard Arthur and American Waldo Bogo. And American Waldo came across the Oregon Trail with the Waldo family, uh, who was one of the early founders of Oregon. And this is a picture of his home where several um, uh, people live, and, and particularly African Americans uh, also um, lived at this site. And American Waldo and Richard Bogo was married on um, January 1st, 1863, and that was the day that the Emancipation Proclamation was um, adopted. And, um, and they eventually moved to uh, Walla Walla, Washington, where they became farmers, cattle ranchers, um, and also opened up a savings and loans. And uh, to your right, you move my little um, is Richard Bogle, who is a descendant of America and Richard Bogle. And uh, Richard, also known as Dick Bogle, became one of the first black anchors. He was a police officer in Portland and became the second uh, city council, black city council member of the uh, uh, city of Portland um, city council. Um, another one who I really, um, is such a, a discovery is Abner Hunt and Sidney Francis. Abner Hunt and Sidney Francis came from uh, Buffalo, New York in 1850, and they arrived in what was to become Portland. And they were very successful dry goods. Um, um, they had a very successful dry good business. 
And when they arrived, they had just passed the 1849 exclusion law. And one of his competitors, um, you, you sued them and said that they didn't belong here. But because of sympathetic um, white friends, over 112 people signed a petition to grant an exception for them to live in Portland. And they stayed another um, 10 years and eventually moved to Victoria. And the, the picture at the top is a lithograph of, of early Portland um, for, um, waterfront area. And, um, and uh, that site is gonna be memorialized by a historic marker upon the approval of Mark, um, Multnomah County. And below, when Abner Hunt Francis left to go to um, Victoria, he joined a, a militia that was formed to protect um, the, uh, the uh, Victoria British Columbus against um, United States in the um, occupation of the San Juan Island. And eventually the militia was disbanded. And, um, and also was noted, it's good to note that these group of African-Americans were recruited by the governor of Victoria, British Columbia, who was recruiting people from California to, to move to Victoria, Canada in 1860. And Abner Hunt and his wife followed. And right here is a, another picture of a, a, a black pioneer who lived outside of the Portland area. He actually, this is George Fletcher, and he lived in um, Pendleton. His family arrived in Pendleton in 1900, and he was about uh, 10 years old. And he had a, a difficult life, and one of his, uh, a pastor who had a church on, um, up uh, Umatilla um, Reservation um, took him in and he learned how to ride and take care of, of horses and he obviously became a rodeo um, champion and George Fletcher participated in the 1910 uh, uh, rodeo and where he, um, 1916 I'm sorry, um, rodeo and at that time, he uh, was competing against um, John Spain. And although the judges asked him to write three times, they did not grant him the championship. And the crowd of mostly white observers was really upset. And so um, the, the sheriff at that time took his hat, tore it in pieces, and sold it. And he one enough to buy to to gain enough money he he, he he i'm sorry he gained more money than he would have if he had won the first first prize and he was he was a town hero there's several pictures of kids imitating george fletcher and he is uh, memorialized at in downtown pendleton um a gentleman named Jerry Warner of, uh, created a bronze statue of, of George Fletcher. And as you can see the, from 1850 to 1860 and to the 1900s, the black population really doesn't grow that, that much. In fact, there's a drop between 1890 and 1900. And, but by 1900, you see are roughly 1,100 African Americans living in Oregon, um, compared to 413,000 um, white settlers. The ending of the Transcontinental Railroad uh, created an opportunity uh, for African Americans. Um, men were involved as um, was employed as porters and um, and waiters and and hotels and and you can see here where there's um, 
several African Americans who served as waiters at the Portland Hotel. And this is a picture of African Americans working on the dining cars. And you see the rise of a black class. They lived, played, and um, worked in uh, various industries. And the picture to your left is uh, a picture of the children who eventually served in World War I. And one of those is George Fletcher right here. Where my pointer is, is George Fletcher. And he became, um, and which he served in, in World War I in, Fr um, in France. And when he came home, he didn't write very much because he had uh, suffered uh, an injury during World War I. But, um, and another staple in that community was the Golden West, Ho Golden West Hotel that still stands today at 7th and Broadway, um, um, on Broadway and um, Everett. And this is the owner, W.D. Allen, and this is the interior of the Golden West Hotel. There's so much restrictions of where African Americans could eat. They often entertained in their homes or, or went to the few places that they could um, eat and dine and, and um, gather. And the Golden West Hotel probably provided not only um, you know, dining service at the soda shop, but they also had um, dinner services. They had a meeting places. Um, women of the, um, the African-American uh, Women of Council they would host their meetings there. And, but it also had, you know, a very um, jazzy side as well uh, with uh, uh, adult spas. And it was often highlighted in the newspaper with um, doing it for the evening activities. That wasn't very positive. <laughs> but I'm not sure if they were just targeted because they were African American. But, um, uh, the newspaper account wasn't very flat on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, that the Colored Women Council would meet at the Golden West Hotel. These are uh, a beautiful picture of the officers of the Colored Women's Council, which would, would serve as some of the early Black suffrage leaders. And there are efforts to, um, uh, to um, find homes um, that of of these um, suffrage leaders. And we recently um, found out information that um, Catherine Gray, or no, I'm sorry, um, Patty Redman, which you will see on the next page, her home um, is still standing. And as I mentioned, Hattie Redman, um, she was memorialized at the Longford Cemetery. She was an amazing uh, Black American suffrage leader. She was uh, responsible for um, um, registering several African Americans um, as voters. And um, she had a, a wonderful history that um, you can learn more about at the Longford uh, Cemetery and as well as um, Oregon Encyclopedia. The Maxfield Logging Community, um, which was a kind of, that story was uh, revealed and shared by Gwen Trice to my right. And she is standing in front of the log cabin that was the, the um, a remnant of that community. And Mackerel, the Mackville logging community was a, a interracial logging community in Wallowa County in Enterprise, Oregon. And Gwen Carr, after, upon passing her father, found out that he was a part of this logging community. And he, um, um, and so she have, she started an organization to interpret that history that is the, the heart of her family history. And you can learn more about um, the Maxfield Heritage 
uh, at, on her website. She's a, a wonderful executive director of the Macville Inter uh, Interpretive Center. And they have an office in Joseph, Oregon. The Billy Rev, Billy Rev F Rise is another iconic building that represents a decade of, of, of service to the African American community, originally built at the colored YWCA, which was very controversial to some. She, it eventually became Williams Avenue Y. It sits at Tillamook and William Avenue in Portland. And um, the home, it was uh, a YWCA. It was served at the USO during World War II. And now it is the really, uh, the Billy Webb Elk Lodge. And it was recently nominated as a historic landmark. Um, Um, as you can see, the population um, prior to World War II was only roughly 2,500 compared to almost a million um, white uh, population. So it was very small. And from 1940 to 1950, you see a significant jump. And this was because of the World War II shipbuilding era between 1940 and 1945, there was roughly, uh, the population uh, increases tenfold to almost 20,000 um, black shipyard builders who uh, was recruited to work in the Kaiser shipyards. And the World War II was an amazing, uh, era of social change. Women entered the workforce and, you know, and, um, and, and provide emergency services as men were recruited to serve in World War II. And here is um, Nina Mae Locks who came to um, uh, Portland or uh, to, to work in a shipyard and it actually wasn't in Portland. She lived, um, she worked in the Vanport, which is in between um, Portland and Vancouver, but she did live in Giles Lake, which was a housing um, facility in Portland where the uh, Montgomery Park um, building um, is sited. And um, to my left is um, a woman who served as a WAC, and that was the woman auxiliary um, council and it was it was the it was the predecessor to the um the army and um, she was selected to be one of the first women in oregon to become a whack and i'm sorry i'm spacing on her name right now other people realize you know know that african american you know came to work in the, the shipyards and build ships but there were many who worked in the foundries as well and here you'll see um an interracial workplace um in one of the probably one of the few prior to the war um where black men and white men work side by side and I mentioned earlier that there was a, the Gals Lake was, uh, was a um, wartime housing. And that is uh, pictured here, kind of an area view of Gals Lake at the bottom left. And to, in the upper left is uh, Vanport, this is the area view of Vanport. And to your right is children playing in an interracial daycare. And that was, uh, unknown, known of, unknown, unheard of prior to, you know, World War II when black and white children played together. And the, the housing um, project provided um, um, many uh, opportunities for um, youth and um, many who lived in it said they had a um, really uh, happy life. It was the first time they were living in new housing. 
Uh, they were, they spent time near the Columbia Slough, especially those who lived in the um, Vanport housing. And then there, there was um, auxiliary groups for youth, and this is a youth uh, fire, um, the, uh, a fire department auxiliary group. But of course, many know of the Vanport flood and, and right here you'll see the dike that broke and that um, created a massive flood that wiped out the entire city of Vanport. And here you see um, another picture of, of the flood before it consumed the city and then people who are leaving and um, escaping the floodwaters. Many thought they, they would be returning home. No one knew that uh, really expected the travesty that um, happened that day on May, um, on, on Memorial Day of 1948. And as I um, pointed out earlier, um, although many of the African-American shipyard builders um, left the area, many did not. And so out of the 20,000, you had a, a, a population of 11,000 that remained um, in 1950. Um, and although the war had ended in 1943, many lived in, were still living in Vanport during the um, fled. And so you had several people who lost their homes um, and, and were searching for uh, new housing within the backdrop of a lot of racist housing policies that restricted um, them from settling in um, areas in Portland. And laws like the, pop, the public accommodation laws were being sought to help was was being um, uh, was doing a lot of energy and activity to pass laws like the public public accommodation law to help he ease the burden of this new community that would live in inner northeast Portland. And this is an iconic photo that hangs at the Capitol of Say in Salem. And a young Mike, Mike Hatfield is working with several members of the North of the NAACP to finally like the public accommodation law. It took several attempts before the law would eventually pass. And I included this slide because this is a site that's now vacant anyway, um, this, this small, uh, uh, the demolished during the urban renewal um, project for Emmanuel Hospital. And it's now a symbol of restoration or, um, or I want to say a reparation of African Americans who lost property and homes during the urban renewal period in the 70s. And the dome, which now sits in Dawson Park, was restored and placed in a gazebo in North Northeast Portland. And prior to um, the real active urban renewal area, Portland began to, to see um, civil unrest. And, um, and Martin Luther King comes and, and address um, the city of, of Portland after African American community at the Civic Auditorium. And O.B. Williams, who was the pastor of Vancouver Avenue, which is now a historic landmark uh, uh, place, um, a historic landmark, is one of the pastors responsible for bringing Martin Luther King here. And you see, you know, at that point, uh, you would start to see people organizing and addressing some of the problems that are happening in that community from housing, employment, education. And uh, the Portland Black Panther Party has established 
to address some of the uh, behavior with police brutality. And below is um, Kent Ford, who was a founder, and Percy Hampton, who was one of the members of the Black Panthers, and another gentleman, I, um, I, I don't uh, have it know his name, but it, they was all addressing some of the social ills that was happening in the Portland uh, community in North Northeast Portland, which is sometimes referred to as a binary. And up here, a lot of people didn't know that the Black Panthers had a medical clinic, a dental clinic. They served breakfast to many of the kids in, in um, Albina. And there is a building that uh, now occupies is occupied by Terry Funeral Home along Rooms Avenue that was once the location of the Black Panther Dental Clinic. And um, then you begin to see uh, people protest the urban renewal plan and, um, and many which were displaced by the Memorial Coliseum here down at the bottom is an aerial view of Memorial Coliseum. And it shows the massive amount of land that was um, cleared in order to build the Memorial Coliseum, which impacted several black households and institutions such as Bethel AME, which is one of the early black churches. And they um, re relocated on Northeast Eight in Portland. And up here, people are protesting the Emanuel Hospital urban renewal. And, um, and I, from 1950 to the 1970, there's so many civic or public investments in the area that did not serve African Americans well. And you begin to see many people really upset about the changes that's happening in their community. There were a few programs such as the Albina Neighborhood Improvement that provided redevelopment dollars to rehab your home. You also had the uh, small business loan program and which lend money to African Americans to start businesses. And this is um, an example of that. This is Hodes and that Dorothy Hat uh, Hatley, who was owners of the Milwaukee Patriot Kitchen in Milwaukee, Oregon, and they became one of the first black bakeries in Oregon. And the um, legacy has been memorialized in two murals, one in Milwaukee and this one that's in Portland at the, at the Michael Enterprise Services of Oregon building on North Northeast MLK. And this little guy is the son of one of the artists who um, painted a mural. And this is just a portion of that beautiful mural. I encourage you to see it. And um, at that, I'll uh, end my presentation. There's so many, uh, so much more I could share, um, but I'll end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, it seems like a lot of the people that you mentioned, you know, Abner Hunt and Sidna Francis and Richard and America Waldo, they lived in Oregon for a time and then they left. Um, was it, were the black exclusion laws just so prohibitive to flourishing yeah. that they had to leave? Yeah, I, um, because everyone, you know, at that time, especially those who, if they were not enslaved Africans, um, like the Abner Francis, I'm not sure if they were ever enslaved, but they witnessed it. They lived around it. They heard stories about it. Um, I didn't mention, but Abner and his wife were both um, friends of Frederick Douglass, and, and Sitna was an early suffrage leader, and he was an early abolitionist. And um, so they were very familiar with slavery and uh, the social ill. And so, and so they really were in search of a decent place um, and wanting to, to get away from that racist institution. And 
and only to find it here in the Northwest. And even though they didn't encourage, they didn't uh, support slavery, they did, um, they prohibited the liberation of African Americans. Right. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of Oregonians, you know, I was raised here. I was never taught about black exclusion laws. And, you know, we are uniquely negative, like negatively unique in, you know, California and Washington did, am I right that they did not have the same extent of exclusionary laws? Well, they didn't have exclusion laws, but that attitude of racial exclusion was still there. And that's why so many people were enticed when the governor of Victoria was recruiting California to move in 1860. And one of the reasons that California had it enacted a law where African Americans had to pay a pro tax. And, um, and so they were, you know, fleeing you know, the racial oppression in California as well. But I, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that also, uh, Abner Hunt would go back and forth to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so he was, you know, part of that group who was enticed um, to move to Victoria. But, uh, and they were recruited by uh, um, Governor Douglas. Um, and um, I can't remember his first name, but he was half black. He, his mom was uh, Creole. Um, and so he was trying to create an atmosphere where African Americans could live in, you know, in freedom in a new, somewhat of a new territory. Um, but one of the things that I didn't mention was uh, we, we had an um, abolitionist in Oregon too, and um, Jim Lobby speaks about, uh, read about, um, I'm sorry, but wrote about uh, abolitionists in Washington County. And it was a small group who was advocating not only to, um, not to include African Americans, but um, I'm sorry, not to, um, from, with anti um, slavery, they were also promoting the liberations of African. But it was a very small group that um, had limited power to make changes. And they were um, part of the group who opposed competition, uh, exclusion laws, mm. uh, exclusion laws that were included in the, pop, um, in, in the um, competition. So there was an effort to recognize, you know, the liberation of, of you know, African-Americans during that time, but the voices were overshadowed. Right. Well, and, and it seemed like many of the people you mentioned were also really well respected and revered in their community, like uh, Mr. Fletcher in Pendleton, Oregon, you know, everyone being so up in arms about him yes. like, losing, mm -hmm. that they funded an even better competition. So, yes, and um, that's a really, uh, that story is, um, the, he memorialized on a historic marker as well in Pendleton, and um, and and he always said when I read in an interview that he wasn't angry, you know, he was just sad about it, you know, but he um, said he won many championships and lost at ones that he thought he should have won, yeah. but um, it was just you know I think he just had a really balanced. Um, perspective about the co context in which he was, you know, writing and the, the whole rodeo um, community. But it was really um, exciting to see that he received, you know, validation for his skills and talent. Right. And there is a cabin that he lived in that I, I would love to see. Um, identified as a historic landmark. But, um, so there's so many evidence of Blacks 
it's historic sites in Portland that many of us are not aware of, you know, and um, and it's uh, and they are threatened by redevelopment pressures. Um, mm -hmm. And one family that I didn't mention was uh, Alan and Louisa Flowers, who um, came to uh, the Portland area in the early 1860s uh, and 1880s. Alan came here in 1865 aboard the brother Jonathan, and he jumped ship. And he, when he married his wife Louisa in um, California, in Victoria, Canada. They moved here in 1888 and they brought, they became landowners and developers and just an amazing story. And there's a affordable housing project in Portland that was um, we, was named in their honor. But when we were working on the exposition, that uh, permanent exposition that would be placed in the courtyard, the, the last two homes were being torn down. Um, and probably will be, you know, uh, apartment buildings. But I was just, you know, so saddened that that history is, is gone, you know. Well, in terms of the, the building history is no longer there. But right. um, you know, those are reasons why we have to really um, uh, protect our, our resources, you know, and, and let people make them aware of the history, the hidden um, in plain sight, <laughs> and and we really have to make sure that we can protect as much as we can. Yeah, I mean the history of Black Oregonians is already, you know, made so invisible in the story that is told, and preserving places like that makes it more apparent, more, um, you know, in our mind and in our reality. Yeah. So. Right. Uh, well, I will put a list of some of the resources uh, that you mentioned in the description uh, below. Right. And I do want to thank you, Kim. This has been a refreshing reaccounting of the history of Black experience in Oregon. And thank you in the audience for joining us virtually. Uh, the Deschutes Public Library has many wonderful programs on deck that you can check out that are all fun, free, and virtual. If you go to deschuteslibrary.org forward slash calendar, uh, you can see a list of our programs and find programs that we have recordings of on our YouTube channel. So everyone be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.